Good afternoon, church. My name is Yuri. Uh, I serve, serve here in the coffee shop. Uh, we've been coming to Anthem for quite some time. Uh, my wife's Julia. We've got three boys, Lev, Rudy, and Jude. Jude turns one tomorrow. So four, four two, and one. Um, today's re reading is going to be, if you're able, please stand for the reading of the word. Galatians 4, uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Please remain standing for prayer. God, we thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your love, for your mercy. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray, Lord, today that we are ready to receive your word Lord, I pray for clarity of speech. I pray, Lord, that our hearts are open. And God, I pray that the Holy Spirit may speak into each and every heart today. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 Church, you may be seated. Welcome to church. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today in the morning, first service, we had a, a wonderful moment where uh, one of our members, Yuri, he gave, uh, or he uh, was water baptized, which is a public proclamation of our faith in Jesus Christ. And it was a wonderful time, and we celebrated as a church and uh, as his brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, today we're going to be continuing our sermon series in Galatians. Um, I think uh, if you've been a, a, a part of this series the last about month, month and a half, uh, and you've been hearing these sermons, you realize that Paul really just has one central theme that he's speaking on. It's been four chapters, about three chapters, full chapters, and it seems like he keeps saying the same thing, right? He's beating the same drum. He's got a central theme that he keeps on hitting today, and today's no, di or uh, uh, throughout the uh, book, and today's no different. Um, he's speaking to the Galatians, and uh, the Galatians um, were people that uh, lived in an area called Galatia. Paul and Barnabas had traveled through there. They preached the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, um, and the Galatians had believed. Um, and so Paul and Barnabas went on, but over time, the Bible tells us that there was these false teachers of Jewish background referred to as the Judaizers, and they were teaching this different, uh, this different gospel that said in order to be saved, you not only had to believe in Jesus, you had to accept him as your savior, but also you had to do certain things. You had to get circumcised, you had to follow the Mosaic law that was found in the Old Testament, and so it was a case of of Jesus plus something else. Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus the law. And so Paul is writing to the Galatians to remind them once again of the gospel they heard at first and believed and that they were saved through grace, by grace, through faith in Christ alone and not by the law. This is the central theme and point that Paul is making in his epistle to the Galatians. And so Paul uses yet another analogy analogy to kind of uh, push across this overarching theme of the letter to the Galatians today, and so that's what we're going to look at. Uh, before we dive into the scripture that uh, uh, Yuri, uh, our brother Yuri just read, um, I do want to just clarify uh, or, or mention that Paul is actually continuing a thought that he had already started in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 23, Pastor Eugene preached on this last week. Paul begins this thought of this concept of sons of God being an heir. And uh, the thought that he began was he called the law, he gave it this kind of constricting uh, um, uh, um, uh, a reference. He called it like a guardian. And he talked about this idea of being imprisoned by the law. And so he begins this thought in chapter 3, verse 23. 
23, he makes a point, and in chapter 4, verse 1, which is the scripture that we read today, he continues and clarifies what he meant earlier in chapter 3. The chapter 4, I don't know why they threw it in there. Whoever designed the Bible threw in that chapter break for some reason. But just understand that there is a continuing thought that has been continued from chapter 3 into chapter 4. And so what he says in chapter 3, verse 23, uh, is that um, the Jews were imprisoned uh, under the law as a guardian. The law was acting as a guardian to prepare for the coming of Christ. The way I shared this morning, the way I look at the analogy he's making is, it's like when I took my son bowling for the first time, and as a four-year-old who, who didn't have a lot of strength in his wrist, nor really knew how to bowl, the first couple of times he went bowling, he hit a gutter, right? Like legit. Immediately would bowl, and it would go in the gutter. And after a couple of times of trying that, he lost interest in the game because he kept failing. He, he couldn't keep it in the lane. He couldn't keep it out of the gutter. And so what they offer is these bumpers that you can put in the gutter that allow and, or that protect the novice bowler, the beginning bowler, to bowl and actually hit the pins, to actually enjoy their time. And so my son would throw the ball, it would ricochet off these bumpers, finally make it over to the pins, knock over a couple, and great success, right? Celebration, we all, you know, uh, we had lots of fun. And so what he's saying is the law is like these bumpers that are placed in these gutters that help the person stay in their lane. The, the law has a purpose. There is a purpose to the law. It protected the ball. It protected the person from ending up in the gutter. It was the purpose of the law to prepare the Jews for Christ. And now Paul says that he has come, the law is no longer needed. And in verse 25, chapter 3 says, it can be put away. Remove, we can remove those bumpers because we no longer need them to stay in our lane. Why? Because verse 26, he says, for in Christ Jesus, you, all, you are all sons of God through faith. And so in today's text, he's continuing this thought. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 7, he's expanding on what he kind of meant in chapter 3. And he begins to elaborate what living under the law was like. And he uses a different, or a, a, a different analogy. He puts it in a different way. He draws on a very familiar picture from Roman culture when he begins to uh, explain the purpose of the law. Verse 1, he says that there's this idea of, a, of an air. And as long as this heir is a child, he is no different from a slave. So in Roman culture, while the son of a rich man was a minor, meaning they were a child, not, not old enough to, to be considered an adult, um, they were usually set under the responsibility and the tutoring of a guardian. And, and actually, in many cases, this guardian or tutor or mentor or disciplinarian, however you wanted to look at him, oftentimes was actually a slave. And this slave, uh, and because slaves did a lot of teaching in the ancient world, they had a different kind of status than what we assign them today in our time. And so this guardian, this person set over watching this child and helping them go from being a boy into being a man, this guardian would decide when the child would wake up, when they would eat, they would decide what they do during the day. It would even, this guardian would even discipline. They had the authority, even though it was not their child, but they had the authority to even discipline and correct this child so that one day this child who is this heir of the father's inheritance so that one day he would grow into being a man he would be prepared to receive this promise or this uh, uh, or, or this uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, inheritance from the father and so Paul says, this is what the Old Testament was like in, uh, this is what the Old Testament was like under the Old Testament Mosaic law. In verse 3, he says, in the same way we also, when we, and when he talks about we, the we that he's referring to is those people that were under the law. Those Jews, those, uh, 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 those, those Israelites that had received the law from God and had believed in God and believed that following the law would honor God. And so those people that practiced the law, those, those that were Jewish, this is the people he's referring to. And this is how he refers to, refers to them. He says, those that followed the Mosaic law were children. 
And they were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. There's this uh, um, connotation of being held captive or imprisoned to or subjected to uh, uh, being under. The, the visual that I get when I read these words, it's like being in summer school, right? Like you're a kid, maybe, maybe you didn't do so well throughout the regular school year, and so to move, move on to the next grade, you got to go to summer school. And so you're sitting there being taught and tutored by this teacher who also doesn't want to be there in the middle of summer, and you're looking out the window, and you see your friends, and they're playing in the sun, they're doing great things, they're going jet skiing, they're going on trips, and here you are because you were irresponsible during the school year, you're sitting in class, perhaps you're in college, you decided it would be a great idea to take summer course and then you immediately realize how horrible, uh, horrible of an idea it is because nobody wants to sit while everybody's having fun in school, in class. You feel like you're constrained, you're being held captive, you're subjected to sitting in these confines while some poor teacher has to teach you. And this is how Paul describes the time of being under the law. Just as young children in the Old, uh, the Old Testament law was like a, a guardian or manager for the Jews before Jesus came. In fact, it was the way the Jews learned and knew the character and mind and nature of God through the law. This was before the Holy Spirit had come uh, uh, and, and, and lived in us, so this was the way they knew who God was. And just as kids were told what to do by others, by their guardians, by their, uh, uh, by their babysitter, if you will, those who taught them how the world works, the law directed the Jews on what to do and how the world worked. And in verse 3, we see Paul say, uh, uh, say uh, uh, that like children, when we were children, uh, we were enslaved to this elementary principles of the world. The NLT describes it as the basic spiritual principles of this world. What are these elementary principles that Paul is talking about? And to very, very simply translate this, because there's a, a little deeper connotations, but simply translated, the elementary principles that Paul is referring to is as though uh, you were to teach a child the ABCs, he's saying. What he's saying is the law taught, taught us the very basics of how the world operated. If I'm going to teach my children how to read, I don't pick up war and peace, throw it in their lap and say, go, right? We don't start with the very difficult, the very complex. What we do is we start with the ABCs. We start with the alphabet and we teach our kids what the ABCs are, what letters make what sounds. And after they learn that, we begin to string those letters together into words and those words into sentences and those sentences into paragraphs. And then we allow them to, or we, we, we move them on into reading books. There's a process, but it begins with learning the very basics of that process. We don't teach our kids math by throwing them complex logarithms or, or, or math problems. What we do is we teach them what numbers are and what, how numbers operate. And then we move on to the complex. So this is what Paul is saying. He's saying the law was able to teach you the very basics of how the world operated. The elementary principles. How does the world function in this sense? Well, this is how the world works. We know this very, very uh, clearly because we live in the world. The world is a works rewards system, right? The, the harder you work, the more you'll receive. It's a cause and effect system. You do well in school and you can get a good grade. You get good grades, which potentially will lead to a good job. You make enough money, it'll give you status, potentially power, and so there's this cause and effect, and actually, we like that. We like that, right? We don't want somebody to take all of our hard-earned money or work, right? We want what we've earned. We want to put in the work, and as long as I put in my honest days of work, I want to be paid an honest wage, right? If I'm going to study for this test and I'm going to try really hard, I want to do better than the person that didn't study at all, right? Like, like, like we think that's fair. We, 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 we will die for those values like in this country, right? We will fight for that freedom that as long as I work hard, I can become something. I think of when my parents immigrated to the United States. I know there's many stories in here about that, but I remember how hard they had to work early on. There was nights that they were gone. They, it didn't matter day or night. They were both working multiple jobs, right? Us kids, we were raised by my grandma. Thank God that she lived with them because my parents were working hard to make a life for themselves, but more so a life for their kids. 
So they worked hard so they could receive that reward. And this is the way of life, and it's not necessarily bad. But what Paul is saying is this is not the way that God operates. These are the basic elementary principles of this world, but this isn't the way of God. And this is how the Judaizers reintroduced the law. You see, they said, listen, you obey the laws of God, and God will be happy. You, if God is happy, then God will bless you. And if God blesses you, then God will let you into his presence, and you will be accepted and loved by him. This was what those legalists, those Jewish legalists, were teaching. This is the new gospel that they were pushing, and Paul calls this slavery. In verse 3, he says, this is slavery. Why? Because you could never hope to keep the law. You could never live a perfect life. You could never fulfill the law. It was as though it was this tutor, this disciplinarian that would micromanage and watch over every single little thing that you did. And no matter what you did, no matter how hard you tried, you would ultimately mess up. And there was this tutor, this disciplinarian, this guardian pointing it out every single time. You messed up here. You said the wrong thing. You did the wrong thing here. Nope, you messed up again. Nope, you messed up again. And what it led to was this this, this religion of shame and guilt, wanting to impress this person watching over my head. And so instead of wanting to do the right thing, you did it because somebody was there that was going to punish you if you didn't. Paul says, this is the elementary principles, but this is not God's way. Paul says, you can't earn God's favor. And so what's the solution? God sent Jesus to redeem us from the oppression of the law, and he makes us sons of God through his spirit. This is what Paul says is the solution to the Galatians. Verses four through six, we see that when Jesus came, the gospel lifted, if you will, this curfew, this, this, this oppressive kind of, like, like this rule-based uh, uh, life that we were living. It brought freedom from this oppression of the law. The way I, and I and I, uh, the analogy I used uh, earlier this, uh, today was the same way uh, uh, when, when I finally got my license to drive, this was that feeling that I felt. Uh, you know, growing up, one of the most anticipated moments in my life, I would say, was to get my driver's license. Like, like I'd been waiting for it literally since I was 10, 11 years old. You know, the, the, the concept, the, the, the thought of having a driver's license came with this concept of freedom and independence, right? Like being able to go and do anything I ever wanted without having to rely on my mom or my dad or my friend to take me there. It was this idea of growing from being a child into a man when I could drive my own car, right? When I could go to work and make my own money, and with that money, I could buy whatever I wanted instead of having to ask my parents for some money or for some sort of uh, uh, um, allowance, which we did not get <laughs> in our household. <laughs> so just for the, so I was very excited to go to work and have my own car, right? And so this idea that I wouldn't have to ask my parents for a ride, it felt like it was that moment where I would become uh, uh, from, a, from, a, from being a boy to being a man. And with a car and license, like I said, I could get a job and make my own money and do my own thing. There was this level of freedom and responsibility and, again, independence that finally came when I reached the milestone and I took that test and I got my license to drive. Now, with that said, my dad would have never let me drive or take the test or allowed me to buy a new car unless he had seen that I was ready and I was responsible enough to take on that task. Driving's no joke. People die from driving all the time, especially young people, especially nowadays with cell phones and distractions. Like, like driving is not, a, it's not a, you know, it's no joke. People can get hurt and die. And so my dad's responsibility as I was growing up and as I was, you know, pushing to take my license test was that he would help train me and prepare me for that moment, for that transition. 
He spent countless hours making sure that I was ready for this responsibility. It began by me sitting in his lap when I was young enough and I couldn't reach the pedals, and so he'd let me move the wheel, drive the wheel, and then when I sprouted long legs and I could reach the pedals, he would move over and allow me to drive in a church parking lot or a Costco where I came a couple of times close to hitting light poles, but there was nothing else, right? So it was a moment to allow me to make my mistakes, and over time, he taught me how to drive stick, and he got to a place where he was confident that once I received this freedom, this license to drive, that he would sleep somewhat decent at night, knowing that he had done his best to prepare me for this moment, to prepare me for the freedom and independence and responsibility of driving. You see, the law, Paul says, has served its tutorial purpose. It's like the teenager that is trusted to be an adult now. They're trusted to get a driver's license, a credit card, right? They're trusted even currently to buy a gun or join the army, the military. As teenagers, this is the responsibility we grow into as we get older. And we have this freedom to make decisions because we understand that our decisions carry consequences. And as we go from being a child into being an adult, from being a boy into a man, a girl into a woman, we mature and we understand that, yes, we have freedoms, but freedoms uh, uh, bring consequences. Now, this newfound freedom that I had driving a car did not mean that I could just go wild, right? Right? Like, like, just because my parents no longer needed to, you know, ferry me to practice or, you know, hanging out with friends or church, it didn't give me this license to just go out and break all the rules, never show up to home, uh, uh, you know, like, like there's, 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 there's consequences to this freedom that we inherit. And there can be a temptation. I remember early on when I got, uh, when I got my license and I finally bought my car, there is a temptation to speed. There is a temptation to stay out till 2 in the morning, even though you know your parents are going to be waiting for you. There is a temptation to pack your car full of 10 other teenagers because nobody else has a car, and even though it's dangerous. There is a temptation to do things that you probably know that aren't right, but you know you can. Because mom and dad aren't in the back seat anymore. You see, this newfound freedom that Paul is speaking about where we are no longer constricted or contained or uh, subjected to the law, is not a hall pass to sin. This is a freedom to act like a mature believer who lives lives to please and glorify his or her Savior. And we do this because Jesus has made us sons of God through his Spirit, Paul says. Paul says in the verses we read that God sent Jesus Christ the Son to identify with us under the law. In other words, Jesus subjected himself or placed himself under the will of God the Father until the time set by his Father for redemption. Jesus joined humanity to live out a shared life, right? He was fully human. He walked the earth just like you and I. He was subjected to the ways of the basic principles of this earth. He was under the law, and yet uniquely, he was also a perfect sacrifice a perfect, fully divine being, fully God. Jesus was fully man and fully God. And Paul says that Jesus came in the fullness of time, meaning that he came at the perfect time because it was the perfect will of God. And the will of God for Jesus, the plan for Jesus was that he would die. Mark chapter 10, verse 45 We just studied this a few months ago. For even the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to be served. He didn't come for selfish reasons, but to serve. Selfless reasons. And the most selfless reason of them all. And to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus was born in order to die. Jesus Christ's death on the cross was not some sort of statement, political statement. It wasn't some sort of gesture that he did, right? It It wasn't a warning, Jesus Christ's death on the cross, the Bible tells us it was payment. And it wasn't payment to dark or evil or the devil. It was payment to God for our crimes in breaking the law. Jesus' death was payment. He redeemed us 
There's this language of this transactionary, uh, ha- something transactionary happening. He bought us from the slavery of sin. He took our place because what we deserved, the payment for our life, was death. See, the law had done its work and work and served its purpose. And so when Jesus came and lived his life, walked amongst us, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, the Bible tells us three days later he defeated death, he defeated sin, he was resurrected. And in Acts we see that the Holy Spirit, it filled us, it filled the believers. He replaced the law with instead a new law that is written on our hearts. When we read the Bible as believers, the Holy Spirit within us says, this is the way. Follow it. When we have the Holy Spirit in us, no longer is it this taskmaster waiting to smack your hand if you do something wrong. No longer is it this, you're you're, you're constrained by rules and law, but but, but we have this freedom. And the Holy Spirit in us convicts us. We organically don't want to do what we used to do and organically want to be in the image of Christ. It happens naturally. It's not forced. Another way to look at the law and what the the relationship the Holy Spirit has or doesn't have with the law is the law is like, like training wheels on a bicycle. My son William, he's learning how to ride his bicycle. I bought him one last, last year off of offer up, and it came with, with, with these training wheels. And he, he, he'd get on, and, and he tried riding his bike, and he was relatively new to it. We never, like, bought him a balance bike or anything, so it was completely new and foreign technology to him. And, and, and over time, he started to kind of get it. You know, he still wasn't good at it. But over time, he kind of got annoyed with the wheels. Why? Because if he goes into the grass, he gets stuck, right? If, if, if he wants to go fast, he can't because those wheels keep getting in the way. He, he, he wants to go ride with his friends, but they're clattering down the road. All his friends are taking off on their bikes, and here he is in this training wheels trying to keep up. So this year when we were talking about the summer and I asked him what he was excited about, one of the first things he said was, Dad, I'm excited for you to take the training wheels off my bike. He's ready to go. Let's go. Amen. Let's take those training wheels off. Let's learn how to ride your bike. I was really proud of him when he said that to me. The boy is ready to move on. He's ready to mature from a very basic level to something more advanced. And so the training wheels, they serve a, the purpose to keep the novice rider from falling. They teach the beginning cyclist how to apply basic principles of riding a bike. But when we look at the Tour de France, we see that not one person has training wheels. If they're so beneficial, why don't they use them? Because they're professionals. They've gone from amateurism to professionalism, and they have something better to keep them on their bike. They have years of experience and their balance. They have their balance. They moved on from the basic to the complex. And so what Paul is saying is when we respond to the gospel message with faith, our training wheels get removed. We no longer need a law to keep us in line. We no longer need those bumpers to keep our bull, uh, or our bowling ball down its lane. We don't need that. We have moved on from that. We have gone from being a child. We have gone from being a boy or a girl into adulthood. We have matured the milk to the meat. And so the Holy Spirit is there to give us that balance on the bike. We don't need the law to tell us what to do. We have the Holy Spirit that helps us stay balanced and in our lane as we live our life. And here's the best part. If you do happen to fall, if you go mountain biking or if you're going too fast and you make a mistake and you fall off the bike and it hurts, listen, the Holy Spirit is there to help you up, to dust you off, to get you back on that bike so you keep riding. That is the purpose of the Holy Spirit in us. And God did all this so we could have the full rights as sons, verse 5 tells us, to redeem us, those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. What, a, what an impactful, what impactful words that he writes here in verse 5. I was just talking with one of the men from the first service, and we just, we just marinated, if you will, to use a cliche word, on verse 5. This idea of adoption. Anybody that's been adopted in their life understands the 
the gravity of what it means when you were discarded, when you were not wanted by anyone, and yet someone came and chose you out of all the others, chose you. What are your redeeming qualities? You had none, and yet they chose you. Not to be some servant, not to be some, you know, worker in the field, but as a son or daughter, as part of the family. If you have Jesus, the Bible tells us, Paul says, then you are sons of God. Now, this day and age, it's important to stop here um, and just clarify something that our gender does not change, right? If you're a woman, you're still a son of God. It's not talking about gender here. What we're talking about here is status, legal status. What it means to be a son doesn't necessarily make you a male or a female. What it means is your status has changed. Who you are is changed. You are no longer an orphan. You are no longer discarded by people. Now you have a title, a son, a child. Sonship in this reference here means you have legal stake in the inheritance of the father. You are an heir to God's promise. Let me remind you that God's promise is of salvation and eternal life. Revelation 21, 4 tells us, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Men, Women, boys, girls, verse 28 in chapter 3 tells us Jews and even Gentiles are all classified as sons through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 6 is a very famous, famous verse in the Bible. It says, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, as sons of God, God sent the Holy Spirit to, for us to know him like a father, but not just to know him, to be intimate with him like our dad. Paul says when we call him, we call him father because the Holy Spirit in us compels us to. Faith alone makes that possible. The terms Abba, Father, are these very informal, but more so personal in nature words that we use when we refer to our dad. There's many scholars that have studied the meaning of these words, and oftentimes these words get, they get mischaracterized. They get uh, sentimentalized. The way, the way I look at this and the way I understand this is my son and I, one thing that we sometimes do is we'll make a run for bubble tea at home. Well, you have a craving, it's kind of late at night, it's before bedtime, and let's just go get some bubble tea. And it's, you know, a 45-minute trip. It's nice to kind of get out, listen to a podcast, just go on a road trip. My wife uh, wasn't supposed to say that. Uh, but it's, it's a time, you know, it's a guilty pleasure type of thing, you know, YOLO, whatever. And, um, and I take my boy with me because, to me, it's a time where I can, like, just talk with him. He's in the car, he can't go anywhere, we got some time to kill. And so I ask him very simple questions. You know, hey, buddy, how you doing? How was your day? Hey, I noticed you fought your sister. What, what was going on? And what's interesting is those moments that I've shared with my son have been some of the most intimate, most beautiful moments. I'm sorry, if you're a dad, you probably understand. If you're not, you'll get there one day. Th those one-on-one -on -one moments where there's nobody listening, there's no walls up, right? There, there, there's, it's just he and I. And not only does he share his little heart to me, and it's incredible what can be on a six-year-old's heart. I share my heart with him. I open up to him. I show him who I am and my character. And yes, there's teaching, and yes, there's correcting, but there's always also just this encouragement, and I try to just let him know that he is loved and accepted. You know what's incredible that, that, that these, these talks often lead to more talks later. And our relationship grows and we become close. It's not just, hey, that's my dad. He considers me his daddy. What I mean by that is he knows that he can open and say anything to me and without shaming him or guilting him, I will still love him, even if it's something that he's not proud of. 
And what's incredible is as I share my nature and my character with him, what I notice is he begins to pick up on some of the mannerisms that I have. He's saying some of the same words that I say. He's doing some of the same actions that I do. It's like a little mini-me. It speaks of an intimate relationship when we refer to God the Father as Daddy. And the only way we, are, we sense and are attracted to the nature and character of God and want to emulate him is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit compels us into this relationship with God. It leads us into this intimate relationship where there is no shame, no guilt. Where we look at God truly with our arms raised. Knowing that we're not perfect. Knowing that we don't have everything figured out. But knowing that the character and nature of God is that he will love you. He will forgive you. And the more time we spent in this intimate moment with God. Oftentimes in prayer. Through Bible reading. Through just being still. The more time we spend with God in his presence, the more we become like God. The more we begin to emulate his character, his nature. The more we grow to be like Jesus. Not perfect, not complete, but ever so closer. There is a sanctification, a growth that happens, and it can only happen through the Holy Spirit, Paul says. Now, perhaps you've been a Christian for many years and you kind of lost that sense of closeness to the Father. You don't call God the Father Abba anymore. Perhaps this is what was happening to the Galatians. Maybe it wasn't just this foolishness that was being preached, but perhaps they had gotten so sucked into feeling that they needed to perform out their faith in God that they forgot what God really wanted and they forgot what the gospel truly was. See, God is like a father who loves you and has an inheritance for you. That is far better than anything that keeps you from coming to him right now. I want to conclude with these final words. We'll look at the final verse. Verse 7. So you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. The more you understand how deeply scarred you are with sin, the more you understand just how far short you fall, the more you are realistic about the depravity of mankind, including your own, the more comforting these last words are for you when you read them. Honestly. The more you understand the sin in your life and your need for a Savior, the more comforting and life-giving are these words in verse 7. One of the most memorable stories Jesus has ever, uh, uh, ever told was about a son who demanded his inheritance early. He wasn't ready for it, yet he told his dad, listen, I want it now. I'm ready to take the test even though I'm not ready. And so his dad gave him his inheritance, and the Bible says that he went off to a far country and squandered all of it, blew it all. And when the money ran out, he found himself at rock bottom, the Bible tells us, feeding pigs. And the slop that was, he was feeding those pigs seemed appetizing to him. He would have willingly eaten it because of how low of a point he was. And he thought to himself, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 15, verse 18, I'll go back to my father and say these words, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. No longer worthy. I've blown my chance. But if you could, in your heart, find some room for me to be considered a servant in your house. And when he was still a great distance away, the Bible tells us that the father, he saw his prodigal son approaching the house, and he ran out and he embraced him. Luke 15, 20 tells us his father saw him and felt compassion, love. The loving, forgiving father embraced his dirty and filthy, 
filthy, but repentant son and, and accepted him. Making his son a slave or a servant in his house was never an option, Jesus says. And we see this in Luke 15, 22 to 23. These are the words of the father to his servants. He says, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. You see, as far as the father was concerned, his son had already spent his life living in slavery when he left him. He already had paid the price. He had already done that which he thought was already what he deserved. And so he was a son in the eyes of the father, not a slave. And because he was a son, he was still, even after all of that, he was still an heir of the inheritance of his father. And in verse 7, this is what God is saying to you and I. When we love Jesus and believe in the promise, we are no longer servants, we are no longer slaves. We, there is no more slavery. There's no more slavery to sin, to law, to addiction, to shame and guilt. Now that we are a son through faith in Jesus, and if we are a son, then we are an heir to all that Jesus has earned on our behalf. We had the water baptism earlier this morning. And water baptism is a public proclamation. It is a reminder of what happens internally, spiritually to us. This is an outward representation of an inward work of grace that has already happened. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, 27 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. The word baptized has this uh, 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 meaning of being soaked in or immersed completely. It is as though you had a white t-shirt and you dipped it into a bunch of red or blue or black dye. And as you pull it up out of the water, when it's been soaked in that dye completely, it comes out and it can't not have that color impregnated it and completely soaked it through. This is what it means to be baptized, not through water, but through Jesus. Just as in water baptism, a person is immersed in water, when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, we see that we are immersed in Jesus Christ. We are now clothed in his identity. And I want to end with these final words. When we baptize somebody, we ask them three questions. We call it the proclamation of faith. And these are very important questions that we need to ask, not just the day you decide to do this in front of people, but each and every day. It is a recommitment. It is a, it is a test. It is a pulling the oil dip, dipstick every morning and making sure we're doing all right. When I married my wife, I definitely told her I love you many times during our wedding day, as I should, right? That would be weird if I didn't. But you see, that wasn't the end of it, right? That wasn't the only day that I needed to utter those words. Now I live a life forever pursuing and loving her no matter what. And not only that, reminding her of that. And what I need to do, and I don't do this very well, but every single day I need to wake up and remind myself of why we are married. Why I loved her and fell in love with her in the first place. Life happens. Let's not forget our first love. And so remind yourself, why did you fall in love with Christ? What was it that brought you, that compelled you to give your life to Jesus? And so the questions we ask in the tub aren't just for the person being baptized for the first time. It's a daily check for each and every one of us. Do you repent of your sins and acknowledge your need of a Savior? Do you understand who you truly are without a Savior? Do you understand the sin that exists in your life? Do you repent? Do you recognize your spiritual need for Jesus Christ? 
Do you recognize that you are off in this far country like the prodigal son? Do you recognize that you are separated from God? Do you recognize that you've been lost and need to be found, that you're dead and you need spiritual life? This is the language that Jesus uses in this parable of the lost son, the prodigal son. Because we see when the son comes, the father says, my son was lost, but now he is found. My son was dead, but now he's alive. This is what happens when we realize just how depraved and sinful we are without Jesus Christ. Do we acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Savior? That's the next question. Okay, so we've acknowledged that we're not perfect and we can't ever meet the standard of the law, but we, do we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior? There's many people in this world that live knowing that they're not a great person. They live under this weight of guilt and shame, and they have no way of breaking free from it. Do you acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior? The son hit rock bottom and realized that no one but his father would take him back. God is ready for you. God is ready for your repentance. God is ready to forgive you. And there's this third question that we ask. Is it your intention to live a different kind of life because of your trust in Jesus and the new life he has given you? Verse 20, the Bible tells us in this prodigal son, he arose and came to his father. There was action. There was movement. There was change. There's this dichotomy of faith and works. His recognition of his status as someone that was lost, as someone that was at rock bottom, as someone that needed someone to help him, led him to action. It led him into a repentant lifestyle. You see, faith and repentance, they go together. They're two sides of the same coin. You cannot have faith without repenting of your previous life. But you cannot repent if you have no faith. Who are you repenting to and what for? So our faith leads us into repentance. And when we repent, the Holy Spirit lives in us and it helps us live a different life. Not one of compulsion, not one of guilt or shame, or I have to, or there is this taskmaster waiting to slap our hands the moment we mess up, but one of freedom knowing that Jesus Christ has died for us, that Jesus Christ's righteousness is imputed on us, that even when we fall off the bike, the Holy Spirit will help pick us back up and move forward to grow into the image of Christ. Church, I want to conclude with these final words. I oftentimes lose sight of this fact, of this gospel. Oftentimes I feel like I just have to try harder to overcome this spiritual hill in my life. I just need to do better, be more positive. And if there's anything I've learned, it's over and over and over, I fail impossible. It may look good for a while. It may feel good for a while. But ultimately, it fails. And so the freedom we have in Christ is not a freedom to go out and sin. It's a freedom knowing that if I sin, I will be forgiven. But more so, it's a freedom knowing that even though I can do it, I choose not to because I want to be like Jesus. That is the ultimate freedom. When you have freedom over sin. And we can only gain that through Jesus Christ. Church, let's stand and pray. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your son. God, we thank you that you sent the law to prepare us for Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you for the freedom we now find in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we have a freedom and an independence, Lord, knowing that you love us. That, you, that, that, that it's not a compulsory faith, Lord, but one, Lord, that wants to be with you, wants to be like you. God, I pray, Lord, as a church, Lord, that we are not, we are not constrained by the basics of our faith, Lord, but may we grow into adulthood. May we go from the milk to the meat, Lord. May we understand, Lord, how beautiful it is to be soaked in your presence.
Lord, I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit may compel us, Lord, to cry out to you, Daddy, to be like you, to emulate you, to, to, to love, to be in your presence and to love your nature and character, Lord. God, I pray for anyone in this place that has perhaps lost their first love, forgotten what it means to be in love and loved by you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we can take a test, Lord, refocus ourselves, God, to what's most important. Lord, may we not be a robotic church, but a live, organic church led by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Amen. talk about the sermon or what you heard if you're interested in this this Jesus that we keep preaching please come up front please speak to us if you're a young person and you have identified that you're a sinner you've identified that Jesus is your Savior and you want to live a different life please sign up for baptism we'll be baptizing in August we'd love to see you we'd love to meet you God bless you guys God bless you this week amen <laughs>